Thank you for joining us on History FM Radio on LiveParanormal.com and History.fm. From paranormal to the unexplained history, it all happens here. Looking to enhance your radio experience? Participate in live interactive chat 24-7 with our radio show hosts and other like-minded people on www.liveparanormal.com. The only interactive social chat room supported by full interactive media. Stop by now and join in on the fun. The views expressed here within the programs and chats do not necessarily represent the views of LiveParanormal.com. You're listening to Live Paranormal Radio at LiveParanormal.com. You are listening to Shriekfest Radio. Good evening. I'm Denise Gossett, you're the festival founder and director and your hostess for the evening. Welcome to Shriekfest Radio. Shriekfest is a horror, thriller, sci-fi, fantasy film festival and screenplay competition. We even have a music video category. We are currently in our 17th year. Sexy and 17. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Our website is shriekfest.com. We have a monthly newsletter you can sign up for at our website, and we are on Twitter at ShriekFest. We're on Facebook. Come give us a like and a follow. Um, Get your projects in. Our next deadline is May 1st, so we accept short films, feature films, short screenplays, feature screenplays, and music videos. So get them in. And if you don't have a project to submit this year, make sure you come out and check out the festival. It's going to be October 5th through the 8th in Los Angeles. And um, it's it's really great for networking. So even if you don't have a project in this year, come network. Shriekfest is a family, and I'm not just saying that. Ask around. Everyone will tell you we become a family, and everyone likes to help each other out. And it is just a wonderful atmosphere in the thick of L.A. where, you know, so many people can be flakes and snobs and, uh, you know, just into them own, their own selves. Uh, Shriekfest is kind of a getaway from that, which is lovely. So definitely come check us out. And... Um, I am super excited because tonight I have an awesome, awesome guest, Jackie Kong, and I'm really excited to talk to her. So I have a call-in number. If you have questions for me or for Jackie, it's 347-202-0316, And if you're shy and you would rather not be on the air, you can always tweet to at Shriekfest or shoot us an email, shriekfest at AOL.com. We will periodically glance at those and get those questions answered. So very, very excited to have Jackie on the show. As everyone knows, um, she ha- is the director of Blood Diner, uh, amongst many other things, and we're going to be chatting about all of that tonight. So let's welcome Miss Jackie Kong to the show. How are you? Hi, Denise. I'm fine. Hi, how how are you? (laughs) Good. I'm excited (laughs) about being on the show. I hope there's some good questions coming my way. Oh, yes. Well, if we don't get any calls, I've had a few people email in some questions today, and I've got a bunch for you. So I'm very excited to chat. Oh, good. So, now, the number is a new number now. I'm actually going to put it up on my Facebook as we speak. Yeah, this, you this know what? Reason, for some reason, seven. yeah, for some reason they changed it, but the 619 should still work. Oh, okay. If people have um, that number, okay. it should go right into my switchboard here. Okay, great. All right, so um, what what do people want to know? <laughs> well, first, let's go back. Let's go back in time. Like, how did you get into this industry? Did you always know you wanted to be in the entertainment industry? Well, I, I from a young age, I filmed. I know that that mm-hmm. uh, you know was uh, it's sort of odd now. Nobody shoots super great, but 
that's what I used to do when I was a, a young teenager. So I would get my friends, to, I'd write these little short films and I'd get my friends to act in them and I would make, I couldn't even drive. I had to get someone to drive me around. <laughs> my own. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and wrangle everyone to be in my films. And then I would uh, cut them and put music to them and, uh, and screen them around for friends and, and family. So, Do you um, have any of those what, still laying around somewhere? Well, I do, but they're, I'm afraid to see what the splices look like now after <laughs> so many years. I, I'm terrified I'm sure. that the whole thing is in pieces, and um, you'd have to. I think that uh, the director of, of Super 8 cut together Steven Spielberg's Super 8 movies that had fallen apart. The splices are just glue, really. So. Um, <laughs> And and that's how they created, I think, a relationship. He was cutting together and archiving his Super 8 films. So I'm a little afraid to open the box, even though I still have them all. <laughs> you know what, and Jackie? You'll have to have a private party, and I'll come over, and we'll sit, and we'll watch them. Oh, okay. Um, I think that would be that so is, fun. Yeah, um, they're like little poems. The only way I could describe them. Describe them. It was um, I, I was inspired by... Um, an Indian film director named Sanjit Ray. So I made a film called Days and Nights at the Beach. It literally looked like Days and Nights at the Beach. <laughs> I love and, it. Because uh, he, he had a film called Days and Nights. Uh, his films were very long and sort of lyrical, and he did the Apu trilogy. And they inspired me um, to make some of these films. And then the others were um, just like little stories. Um, one was called Three Feet of Fury, which was I put my brother in it. And uh, and so it was, and, and some just uh, just films I I felt like making at the time. So that's how I started, and I began writing. Writing was the 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 way I I started making feature films. I wrote my first feature film and got actors to be in them. Wow! Now, yeah. wh- how was your family? Were they supportive? Did they think you were crazy? What were they thinking when you were making all these little Super Eight films? I think that uh, I borrowed my stepfather's Bull U Super 8 camera, which was a great camera. Nice. And um, they, uh, yeah, my mother was an actress. So I, I was always, I always, I was surrounded by actors all the time uh, growing up. And so I would even get people like Harry Dean Stanton to be in my student films, my 16 millimeter <laughs> films. And, yeah. And he was sang a duet with Marlon's ex-wife uh, with Movida, who was in the original um, um um, what was it called? Mutiny on the Bounty, and um, and and I would get them to be in my films, and so um, you know I don't I I thought that was normal at the time. I realize it's really not quite so normal to have access to actors that could uh, be in my films. <laughs> All right. I I, you know I, that's what I, I, because I was surrounded by actors before I did that. I did puppet shows before I got my Super Eight uh, camera, and I would put on <laughs> puppet shows for kids at parties and um and I realized it would be like nobody watching <laughs> the show. all the kids were doing something else and I looked out and there was only adults standing out there watching my puppet shows so it was actually really strange um the kids weren't <laughs> interested um but then then I graduated from super 8 to 16 started making 60 millimeter films and then um um, wrote my own uh, first horror film. Actually, when I was in my early 20s, I was uh, 22 at the time, and I got um, Martin Landau to get, be in it by posing as a uh, an acting student in, in his acting class, and I handed him the script and I asked him if he'd do it. I just <laughs> went out and just did it. I mean, it was it was the nobody was it was waiting to give me a, a an opportunity. I just went out and and. Um, wrote it and then would go, run around and get it made um, and ask people because it. it just seemed like the thing to do. Um, even though I had no money to make them, it seemed like it, it, it would, uh, they, the money would arrive eventually if I got the right group of people together. Nice. Yeah. So, so, um, so like a lot of it, it seemed like um, you didn't know that you couldn't do it, so you did it, which I love. Correct. Yeah, and and I was inspired by films I saw uh, growing up, watching films at the New Art. That my mother was a cinephile, so it would take me to see these great films. With, since I was, uh, you know, Chaplin when I was eight, nine, all the films at the Las Vegas Theater, then at the New Art, and um, um, 
art films from Europe. I saw a lot of um, foreign films, got used to just, you know, reading subtitles a lot and, <laughs> and watching <laughs> films. And then um, then I began to write my own. And for, for, interestingly enough, because um, a horror was something that I knew I could I could get, you know, I could get out there, I began writing horror films. Were you always a horror fan? Um, not really. I was more. I just. Uh, I, I just like good films. In fact, if you look at Blood Diner, I think it sort of transcends the um, horror genre. I didn't make it. I, I think people that don't particularly like horror like Blood Diner, and the ones who do love horror love it, because I. I, I think I pulled enough um, surprises in there that even a, a hardened horror aficionado is surprised by it. Right, and um, you know, and it even though it was you know shot a while back, it still holds true. Like you don't watch it fact, and go, oh "My gosh, that's so cheesy." It's like somehow you were ahead of your time. And, and I would say I was probably about twenty years ahead of my time because <laughs> yeah. when we made the film, yeah, it was considered so odd. Nobody knew what to make of it. Even um, you know, I, I, there are things that I did that nobody had done before. And, um, you know, and I don't want to spill, have any spoilers, but there are some um, things that have been copied several times in other horror films now, even as recently as last year in, in Ash vs. Evil Dead and in, in Scream Queens. Um, they're just, there's just, you know, we did so many things that no one had ever done before. Um, the Mambo killing to the music was before Quentin Tarantino did it. Um, right. The, the mask with the killings in the um at the at the um aerobics thing was way before even Catherine Bigelow did um point break and um and the 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 biggest thing were the killers were incredibly charming and likable which was completely unheard of when I made that film this was 20 years before 25 years before Dexter and um <laughs> when and when we and we did it people were like way offended especially the rating board they thought it was socially um, had no redeeming <laughs> values whatsoever because it was morally they thought uh, upsetting to them because the killers were so likable, and um, and also I, I I patented after those guys that used to bomb abortion clinics that were like pillars of the community, extremely handsome young guys that go to church and looked up at God that God told them to go kill all these people. All and, right. Um, and, yeah, and it was no one had ever done that before. It was like so off. It, it, the way it was written was supposed to be ghoulish killers, and the way I directed it was completely different from um, that in the script. And and it was upsetting to a lot of people at the time. So it took um, fans in Europe, and it actually was it was picked up in Europe, Germany, Japan, Italy. Um, they loved the film, and they got the, the sort of the artistic um, oddness of it, and. And and they then and then it sort of circled back to the United States, and it was the fans that made it into a cult film. It was really um, with the advent of the internet, um, the fans started spreading the film around, and it became sort of like a wonderful secret that people would find and share with other people. <laughs> right. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's sort of the genesis of, of Blood Diner. But before I did Blood Diner, I made a comedy um, shot with 55 comedians you know, on weekends only in Los Angeles wow. because we had no money. And so everyone was working on other films, and I shot 35 millimeter. I worked with um, Andrew Dice Clay, Billy Barty, Linda Blair. Um, wow. Gosh, just uh, J.P. Morgan, um, Pat Morita. It was just a, we just had 55 stand-up comics, and we shot weekends only way before Robert Townsend even did his um, movie on credit cards. And right. that film became... Yeah, that film became the number one film in New York City and, went, and was shipped platinum in the video market because it was so successful and played like all over the country theatrically and then um, and then went platinum in the video market. So that was the one I did before Blood Diner, but at that but I was only 25 when I when I directed that film. Oh my gosh. And, and it was really odd because everybody couldn't believe a woman at that time, especially a young woman could um, direct such body comedies and such <laughs> outlandish, outrageous uh, horror films. So it was like a real culture shock. People, even in Italy, I, I went to um, Italy to meet the distributor, and they had dubbed my film in Italian, and they dubbed a man's voice 
uh, where um, where I was giving directions for the outtakes, and it was like, boss the regards, you boss the regards. Are you kidding? Yeah, was, they thought I was a man, and um, and when I went into their office, it was like a visual shock for them. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> they, describe it. Um, they were like in shock. They really thought that, that I was, they couldn't wrap their brain around it um, <laughs> uh, because they just assumed I was a man and they even dubbed me as a man. Um, but it was, it was, um, you know, women were just weren't in that genre and they weren't also in, in comedy that much. I picked genres that were very male dominated um, and still pretty much remain so. Yeah. Now, okay. So when, when you started getting, you know, for your first films, when people started going, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. How could she do this? Was it frustrating you, or was it just making you even stronger? Well, I would, I, you know, I, when I did my first horror film when I was 23 uh, with Martin Landau, Jose Ferrer, I wrote it myself. Um, it was a disaster. It, the film came out really well, and a lot of people loved that film, more than even Blood Diner. Um, and but it was it was inspired by Alien and it, it had a sense of humor that Alien didn't even have, and um, so when I made that film, my career was over because uh, you know the, the the producers didn't want to give it to uh, Samuel Goldwyn to release, which was a, they didn't want to pay a lot of money for it, and they ended up with another distributor and it didn't do very well, and um, so my career was over by twenty by twenty four pretty much as a director. Um, <laughs> because they look at yeah. So, so um, then I decided, okay, well, I don't, you know, we don't need any money. I'll just shoot weekends only. I found this uh, comedy, and we shot for uh, beginning April all the way from April fifteenth through June, uh, beginning of June weekends only. And then the film came out so funny, and my crew loved it. Um, I wanted to just continue working for free. Everyone worked deferred on it. Um, and then we just shot, they said, just came, they came to me and said, let's just finish shooting this film. Everybody will just take off from work and, and uh, we'll wrap it up in two weeks. And we ended up shooting that. And that is the film that became a big um, commercial success as well as critical success. Um, Vincent Canby in the New York Times gave it a rave review in the New York Times. And he actually paid to see the film in a theater because we didn't have critic screenings. And he saw the trailer I cut at a theater and the trailer was really funny and um, made really made you laugh. And it was on the, um, on a, um, another, with another hit comedy and he paid to go see it and gave it a great review, which then catapulted our, our, um, our um, screenings from 90, our our theaters from 90 theaters to 110 theaters in the New York area, which is a lot. Wow. And usually, yeah, usually you go down. You know this, Denise. Usually it's like even with a hit movie, you drop 30%. My sure. film went up. It went up over 20%. And so um, then it, then from that word of mouth, all the other theaters started booking all over the country. So it went out theatrically successfully, and we were normally usually number one in every city we, we um, played in. Um, so that happened very young. And you're right. It was really sort of strange, um, uh, you know. Uh, I was such a, an oddball in the genre at that time that was was totally dominated by men that um, nobody knew what to. Uh, nobody was calling to hire me. It was the same glass ceiling, um, even without right. you know. Uh, so it was a. It's a little tricky for women, um, and I and I hate to say this. I I I think that even um, Catherine Hardwick. Um, faced it as recently sure. as you know, um, as Twilight. She did a great job directing that film. Uh, whether you like that film or not, she did a great job doing it. She right. found those actors, um, and you know, it became a hit. But they didn't bring her back to uh, direct the, any of the sequels, which is a, a you know, no one ever says that. But I'm going to say it right now. That's a, that's unbelievable. That would never happen to a man. Right. So, exactly. Yeah, that would never happen. Immediately they would say, you know, hire the, the director to, to do the sequel or at least offer him the sequel. Right. Um, yet alone six more and or five or six more and not one offered to that director. Now, I know a lot of directors won't yell about it or complain about it because they want to work in town. But, you know, I've realized that no one's calling me anyway, so I may as well say something. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Jackie. You know, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, someone told me take names and and uh, and you know <laughs> say it like it is because really that's what it is. You can prove yourself um, over and over, and women don't get a break at, at behind the camera, and that's a travesty. So I always talk about that a little bit. Um, and what what the frustration is is that every time you begin a film, it's almost like starting all over from scratch, even if you have the biggest cult following. And I was very happy with um, Fangoria for writing, you know, the last, when the, the Blu-ray came out for Blood Diner uh, from Lionsgate by popular demand, not because, you know, uh, you know I, I, and again, I think it was a female executive at Lionsgate that saw the value of it, but the demand was there from the fans and the, the horror fans. Um, they were upset that the, that, that the film had never gotten a um, decent um, DVD release in the U.S. as well as a Blu-ray, as, but in Germany it did. Germans, um, you saw the German Blu-ray. Did you see how beautiful that was? Yes. I mean, the the it, German it DVD. It was beautiful. Um, they loved the film in Germany. I was invited to um, to the Berlin Film Festival. Um, uh, I, uh, the, they get it. They wanted Germany and Japan understood the film and wanted sequels um, of, of uh, Blood Diner, and they did a beautiful like collector's item, a collector's edition um, of the uh, with a with, with a little. I don't think I put it in, but it has a, like a little brochure and a little pamphlet and really beautiful sleeve and um they gave it the full red carpet treatment as uh, an art film oh, wow. and um that that is something Lionsgate did later we started we released it in September of last year um at kicking off their uh, a series of horror films they're releasing on Blu-ray so um uh, so, so you can wow. get it now on Blu-ray and on the Blu-ray is the uh commentary as well and a, and a very rare interview with me that I, I rarely go on camera and give interviews and it's on that Blu-ray. Um, nice. Yeah. And where can so, people uh, get it? Um, you can buy it on Amazon or um, okay. go to Dark Delicacies out in Burbank. Oh, yeah. I'll plug Dell's bookstore. He's got, I think, a couple of autographed copies there. I, I was there for a signing when this, it came out in September and um, I was actually quite surprised. There was a line of people waiting for uh, for me to sign uh, the Blu-ray that they pre-bought uh, for, for, at Dark Delicacy. And um, wow, because I wasn't going to show up. And I said, I don't think I really need to show up. And then they said, No, no, you've got to come because all these people are waiting for you to sign their their um, Blu-ray. <laughs> and, <laughs> wow, that's got to uh, that feel was- pretty amazing. You know, I take it with a, you know, it, it took, you know what I, I say about uh, Blood Diner? Blood Diner was a film that I made so far ahead of its time, and it, it and the horror films, of horror fans loved it back then. It played at the Castro in San Francisco for after it got sort of dumped in the in a theater in on Market Street, and then, then the Castro, they loved it, so they played it there for a, a month or so. And, it, I mean, it, it got, had a, a niche market, that you had to be a pretty sophisticated, you know, um, film viewer to get back then. And so we, mm-hmm. so it was like, it, as someone said to me, I was talking to my cinematographer when we were remastering the uh, DCP for the Insanity Tour we're on right now. We're actually taking the film on the West Coast for the second half of it. Um, we were at the um, Alamo Draft House in New York, in Denver mm-hmm. with the film. And we, the new remastered DCP looks incredible. And now we're oh. coming in to, um, to Vancouver and Seattle in April. Just got the booking for San Francisco at the Roxy Theater in um, in uh, at the end of April or beginning of May. And wow. um, we're going. Yeah, we'll wrap up the big Insanity tour in LA um, somewhere. Then you're working with us on that. Yeah. And I'm. I'm happy about that. I, I think yes. it's a, I'm looking forward to working with you and sort of having the big party right where we shot the film on Hollywood and uh, Coenga. Yeah, so it's going to be amazing. Out. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm, uh, we have Sheetar, the original demon in the film, uh, in, 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 in the new and improved version as a, a, a transgender, <laughs> transvestite, um, demon goddess that uh, comes <laughs> brought back to life. Actually, she's the only one that, I don't even want to spill the beans, but she's um, she's the new uh, version of the 
of the goddess in the film, and she'll be there. Um, and we'll, we have um, great music um, from DJ Pervula, which I believe you had on your show. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah, he took the soundtrack, the dialogue in the film, and dance music, and he did a whole mix. So it's been, we've been touring awesome. with that as well. Yeah, Excellent. so we have some great... And, uh, yes, and, and we, a big party. Everyone, we everyone don't have, have full a dates. We don't have full dates set yet, but as soon as we know, believe us, we are going to be getting the word out. And so make sure you guys come check it out. It's going to be the movie Blood Diner in a theater. Get to actually see it in a theater again. It's been a long time since people have been able to do that, other than the touring you've been doing. And then there's going to be parties in the actual location where she shot, which is pretty and amazing. Q&A, which, um, I guess, are you running the Q&A, Denise? Uh, I, I think the that's going to work out that way, yeah. I think that'll be a lot of fun. So think of good questions if you know the film. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. It's very lively. Uh, the one in New York was extremely fun, and um, and we had uh, we just had a lot of um, banter. But the, the the group in New York they knew the film inside out. It was literally the um, the organizer's favorite film of all times. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, he said that it was like such a – he was so excited because he says it's the film that he uses to compare all other films to. Which was wow, a great, what a compliment. Um, it was, uh, you know, he really and, – and I've had people come up to me because I won the Etheria um, Inspiration Award in June for um, women in film. And they nice. – and people yeah, – it was really nice. Surprisingly, a lot of women – and men came up to me and said the film inspired them and literally changed their life. And I don't, I it was like, I thought it was at first a joke when people were coming up to me saying it changed my life. But then I was, tr- I, I brought Tommy Chong with me. He's a friend. And uh-huh. I turned to Tommy and I said, um, you know, people have been coming up to me telling me this film changes, changed their life. Literally because it's so bawdy. It's so in your face. And, um, right. and just, when I said that, another person walked up and said, this film changed my life. And I just like the timing couldn't be any better than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, um, now, Jackie, I, I have a question. Sure. Now, um, you recently told me the answer, but I want uh, everyone to hear. So on your IMDb page for Blood Diner, when you look at the actor, the cast list, like nobody has a picture up, and can you tell me why that is? What who are these actors that don't have pictures up on IMDb? Oh, um, interesting. Um, Blood Diner, um, our budget was so low, and the producers said to me, "Well, um, we're not going to go SAG." And so I said, "Well, the only way that I can make this film work for me is I'm going to go full Fellini style." and hire people off the street that have a, a kind of a character or a look. And particularly what I wanted and I mined in the, in the clubs of Hollywood were musicians. So a lot of the actors, including the um, Rick Burks, was a, was a musician. Because I, my thinking was, because I just worked with a bunch of comedians and I came up with a whole style to, to direct comedians that were like drugged out of their minds. 55 <laughs> <laughs> which was, a, which was a, a challenge for any director, yet alone a 25-year-old director. Sure. Um, but um, the the idea with about Blood Diner was to try to get um, characters and performers, that uh, musicians that had been on stage before, so at least I knew I could direct them. Um, they were used to being in front of an audience. But I, but they were not actors, and um, and then and then a lot of the characters were, were just people I found on the streets of Hollywood, and um, wow. And then we, um, and so that's why we, a lot of people say we we saw them in Blood Diary and we never saw them again. <laughs> right. Well, it's pretty impressive and, that you were able to take non-actors and get such good performances. I mean, really, that's that's hats off to you as a director. Well, I insisted on uh, rehearsals for three weeks prior to shooting with everybody, nice. including the, including the zombies. I rehearsed all the zombie attacks. Um, wow! I lined them. 
<laughs> because I knew that we were shooting very fast, and I wanted right. to um, make sure uh, make sure they could that we got these great attacks as well as the performers who had never been in, in front of a camera before. That's so amazing. I had to really first them and and get them focused and disciplined. And as an actor, you know that it, it you know you have that moment to to perform, and you have to know how to arrive at that moment. Yeah, and so that rehearsal just helped them tremendously. So when I called them up, they knew exactly what I wanted. I knew what I was working with, and I also knew if I wasn't able to get a performance, how to cover them somehow, um, you know, to make it interesting. So, but I always, you know, for example, the and I, I hate to say this, the dummy in the film. Do you remember the dummy? Uh huh. Okay, that was a scripted character. <laughs> Okay. In auditions, I said, I said, screw it. I said, I'm, I'm uh, putting a dummy in this part, and everybody looked at me. <laughs> Were they like, Are you crazy? What? They thought I was insane, and I said, I turned to the art department. I said, Make me a dummy. I said, There's nothing that sells loneliness more or bad business better than a dummy that you have to <laughs> talk to. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Exactly that's a Jackie Kong, you know, kind of inspired thought. And I right, an also, ism, a Jackie Kong ism. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, I know and, when and I first saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just too funny. Where is she going with this? <laughs> yeah, you can't tell. I, I I actually defy people to try to predict where I'm going with, with any of it. And even people, that's why it holds up now because, even now, an audience cannot predict what's going to happen in that film. No, you really can't. And everything is so meticulously done, like the the sets, the props. I mean, everything, I, you can tell you really thought everything out. And I Every think that's why it holds true nowadays, too. Because uh, every shot in that film was, was was designed and drawn out. Every lighting diagram. I believe it. Set, it. Yeah. I, I, I made everyone, uh, my department heads draw out everything, which is unheard of in a low-budget movie. Um, we had set drawings. I had my, uh, my, my DP looked at me and said, how am I supposed to draw the lighting <laughs> diagrams when I don't know the location? And I said, imagine you're on a stage, a theater stage. And that's why a lot of the, um, the lighting is theatrical. He created lighting that didn't exist in any rental house because I would, I would say I want the key lights to move in the back room. The only person that was at that time that was moving key lights in the back room was Ingmar Bergman and uh, there's an, in heavy duty dramas. And if you notice the lights in the back room, they're rigged to move. We had to, we had to actually create um, uh, lighting rigs that didn't exist in order to move wow. all the key lights at the same time. Um, again, all designed to give you a, a sensation of, of the supernatural. This is before CGI, so one had to be super clever just creating it in the camera and on the set. So every set that you see is, was drawn out. Every, every, we rehearsed for three weeks um, with every actor, including the zombies. That um, is amazing. And then that way, um, and every shot, literally I'd walk onto the set with a shot breakdown of 50 shots per day. And um, we have 50 to get 25 a by day. 50 a day. And, and let me remind everyone: do... this is on film. This is not HD or yeah, video is... or. Right. Wow. And, and I have to be very conservative with the film because you only you know, this film is very expensive to shoot on. Yeah. So I would say things to my um, my right hand, um, which is which is a woman script supervisor. I'd say. I split my set sometimes, and I say, "Get me five seconds of the food coming off of this. Get me thirty seconds." Because I, I come from editing too, so I know right. exactly what I need thought wise to to piece it together. I had it all pieced together. I deconstructed it, put it back together on uh, on paper, and then and then the last sequence, the big club scene. Uh, I did ninety setups a day for four days with a hundred oh. extras, prosthetics. Uh, explosions, a live band playing, and, and and zombies that have to become zombies over the course of the 10 minutes. Oh, so, my uh, gosh. Yeah, so that was a headache from day from the moment. And the only way we could do that is I had Yurig pre-light the entire club 
uh, from rigs off the top of the club. And um, again, rehearsed. Everyone was was ready and rehearsed to go. And so we, when I'd call it up, it would be just like pure execution. But I had a headache really from the moment I walked on the set till the, the the end of the day. But I knew I needed those that many shots to make that sequence work. And um, and my, and the editor looked at me. It's like saying there's a war. Okay, the editor uh-huh. looked at me and said, I don't even know how to put this together. <laughs> You shot so much coverage. I mean, so many things happening. Yeah, that is not scripted. None of it was scripted. Um, I, I had them keep inserting pages in the script as I was as I was um, creating um, all of the the uh, the little vignettes that were taking place. Because if you look at the club, it's always like cut away, cut away, cut away. Don't finish it. Cut away to something else. Come back to it. Then cut away. There's like six different stories going at the same time in there, if not more, more right. like ten. And um, and and so I had to cover all of that. With but anyway, that that impression that everything is planned. Everything had was there for a reason. To create, uh, well, uh, and those are the best movies because you can tell that you know everything was really thought out and meticulously put together. And it's a really tight movie. The movie t- is tight. I mean, there's nothing. That's again, I don't, I don't see that kind of that many tight films where you it moves like that with a kind no. of craft. Everything um, has a purpose. And, and, yes, and and even the, the the cinematic techniques that I use, for example, in the club, um, every time you hear Wagner. It's part of the their mindset that score. Then whenever that that gets broken, you hear the club band playing, and that 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 takes over. Then when it's back into the ritual, it, it, it swells back into the Wagner. Anytime you're Wagner, everybody has a theme in that film. That and, is and great. That's a, and 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 so there, therefore you can create this sort of subliminal um, uh, sensation of presence of other things happening while you're looking at something else so it has, it's got like on the big screen Denise you've got to see it on the big screen people that have loved the film the big fans in New York told me that uh-huh. they saw things they never saw because I'm directing three layers of action in the, in uh-huh. the club and in the and in the diner so you watch awesome. the diner you'll see the two actors in the foreground you'll see mid-ground uh, people eating and, and the cheerleaders you'll see out in the street the meter maid arguing with, you know, in the line of people out. There. So there's like literally three layers of action. <laughs> that wow. I'm and you can really see it on the big screen. It's actually um, something that was, they commented on in New York. Um, they said they, they just blew them away because they didn't realize there were three layers of action going on. Um, that, um, that all adds to the richness of the, um, of the film. And, and creating a place that doesn't really exist because there was no diner. We created the diner. We created the club. We created the back room. All of those were empty shells. Ugh. It all looks so amazing, all, too. All for, but I don't even want to tell you the budget. Let's just put it this way. All for a, a budget that is normally the catering budget, budget on a normal film. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, you use that money wisely, let me tell you. Okay, so a question came in from someone named John, and he mm-hmm. wants to know, um, okay, so the screenwriter was Michael, and he's asking, how did you two meet? Like, how did you come about this script? Oh, Michael um, never set foot on the set. Whoa. He wrote the script as a, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I normally don't like let writers come onto my set because their vision of what the film is, especially with Blood Diner, is completely different from what I was doing. And in fact, the he had written the script for a producer named um, Jimmy Mazin, who was an old, old friend of my sister's. I knew that he had a script that had been sitting around a long time, and I was just just came off the um, Night Patrol hit. And I asked him to send it over, let me read it. And I read it, and it was, like, super serious. Like, serious as a heart attack is the only way I could describe it. And, um, oh. you know, the, the two brothers were really ghoulish. Um, they were. They had a couple of horror guys they had originally wanted to um, put in it. They they had it. They they sort of tried to get it made for I think like four or five years, 
as a serious horror film. And then um, when I, when, what I did is I said, give me the script, Jimmy, and let me take a look at it. And uh, maybe I can put it onto my three-picture deal over at Vestron. And uh-huh. um, so within a week, I got the film um, put on because they wanted me to direct a horror film for them. And um, so, but my take on it was completely different. So um, when I started casting and, and uh, making it have humor, even Maslin got uh, upset. He said, you're ruining the film. But, if I, but I feel like if I would have directed it the way it was written, um, it would not have the legs that, uh, and, the, and the cult following that it has right now. It would be just one more overly serious, you know, um, killer slash movie that was sort of made uh, as, a, as a copy of... Um, uh, Blood Feast, because Jimmy had owned a bunch of um, Herschel Gordon Lewis films, which I never saw. Sure. I never saw Blood Feast, and I didn't want to see it, because I didn't want it to influence the way I, I handled the film. But Michael Sunday never came onto the set, and I never m- really met him or talked to him, except for wow. maybe brief. Yeah, you know, he's an actor as well, and I didn't put him in it, and I didn't really... Um, um, ever have him onto the set and again it's you know i just know that it's because i knew i took a totally different direction and i didn't really have time to argue yeah i I, they were jimmy was a little upset and he said i I ruined the film um about halfway through the film and so he didn't get even my producer and he wasn't really the producer anyway he was just the guy that had the, the script the producers really were Ellen Stelloff over at um, Best Run, and she never really got the credit for that. I got to say, she's the money person. Ellen mm. was the one who got the movie green lit over at Best Run, and another woman. And again, um, she was the one that was on the set. My producer really was Jay Koi Y. He was the hands on uh, producer on the set, hiring the crew. And um, his strength is from the art department because he works extensively with, uh, in the art department. And so I got really good art department people because of him. And, um, and then, um, you know, pretty much I carried, you know, one of the things, Denise, you asked me, I carried a lot of people uh, that just were not qualified to do the job. And that right. was one of the things I stopped doing uh, early on. And that was pretty, one, pretty much one of the big frustrations uh, of being a director early on, so young and being female, is that a lot of people wanted to sort of take all the credit and not really uh, let uh, and let it be known that that there was a woman director directing the movie. You know what I'm saying? Right, so I, I sort of right. Got tired of, of of carrying people. Um, Jimmy never did anything before, and he never did anything after as a filmmaker um, or a producer. But um, apparently, you know, um, and I got tired of carrying him. Um, I got tired of carrying a whole bunch of people that were not supportive in the process of making the film. And um, and I just won't do that anymore. Uh, I just like, if, if, if they're not on board, I just don't really want to waste my time. Sure. Yeah, because I'm a powerhouse in that I can get things made. And I can get things made for almost no money. And, and, there, and I can get it made so that it has legs that can last decades. But I'm not going to carry a bunch of people that don't pull their weight. And that's one of the things that you find um, as, a, as a director sometimes, that, you know, you're, you're carrying a lot of people that are not um, contributing. So, you know, I, I never saw Michael Sonny on the set, never saw him after. I think I ran into him at Mo- Monster Palooza last year, one time 30 years later. But, you know, to answer the question, no, um, that was, that's the genesis of that sort of uh, um, process um, with um, that writer particularly. But any other questions? <laughs> uh, where did you guys shoot? We shot on the corner of Hollywood and Coanga, hmm. and we were extremely sort of high profile um, on the um, corner uh, we transformed a what's now a pizzeria at that time was an abandoned um, uh, storefront into the diner, and oh. I had um, yeah, I had K. K. Barrett, who was a great art director that Jay brought in, who did I think was nominated for an Academy Award for um, being John Malkovich. Very talented young. We, we were all very young at the time, 
and um, he uh, transformed that space into the diner. The door going to the back room was a, a phony door that every time they went through that door, they would go into another set that we built <laughs> on a location at a club that we also shot, uh, where we shot the uh, Club Dread scenes. But that oh, was a wow. big club. On, yeah, it was on Hollywood and, and La Brea. So we were, we were able to take it over and build several sets on that uh, location. And, um, and so we ended up, uh, you know, filming on the streets. And I remember it was so crowded back then on that boulevard that the police would sometimes have to shut down the boulevard so that we could um, film. <laughs> and um, that was really great. They actually were really wonderful, the, the um, Hollywood Police Department. And the only thing that, that ran, we ran into, I had a lot of women working on this film. My, my producer, Ellen Selloff, was a woman. My production manager, Tiki Goldberg, a woman. Um, you know, uh, my, I would say more than half of the department heads and crew women. My key grip was a woman. Uh, Dolly Grip was a woman. Wow. Um, yeah, that's another thing that people really didn't acknowledge. Um, in, in this was a film that was not only, I would say, more than half women and directed by a woman. By a woman, um, it was also really multi-ethnic. Um, you, you know, it was way before its time on that front as well. And um, it, it's it's odd to me, you know, when you the you know you asked me about frustration. The only thing that is somewhat frustrating is. We went out and just did it, and we, and we showed that we could we could play in, and, and do it better than the boys. But yeah. At the, same time, at the same time, I don't see a lot of people wanting to give that credit. In fact, they will almost want to bury it, and that is, would be my only frustration um, with some of the the, the whole um, you know Hollywood aspect of it, or even producers. But I understand it's a, a business in which people are all you know trying to grab whatever they can, but I think you got to give credit where credit is due sometimes. And that's why I was sort of happy that I made the top 10 female horror film directors this month. And yes, and that more. was recent. So you want to talk a little bit about that? That's really amazing. Yes, I just got it sort of out of the blue. Um, the film just continues to hold up, and people continue to discover it and love it, as well as the other films that I've directed. But that one was a, was a nice honor. Yeah, to uh, to be in the top ten with the other women, and I thought I was in really good company, or I am in good company, and I like to see the, uh, the, that being recognized. And was recognized by a, you know, the internet sort of changing and leveling out the playing field as far as recognition goes. Sure. Um, whether that's translating into jobs for women um, and being a part of the the in the in the um, game is another issue. But I always, you know, I'm happy to have the recognition. You know, I, I said to my cinematographer, I guess better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so so that was But, you know, that, like you know, it's one thing to be honored with that award. It's a whole nother thing to be honored with that award when, like, your movie wasn't released last year. And they're still thinking about you. So to me, that's that's even better than if you had a really recent film. Well, think about this, Denise. I mean, usually a studio or a distribution company, they spend a lot of money to get this kind of recognition and this yes. kind of buzz. I spent nothing. It's the film that is held up over the years, and it's the fans that have created the buzz. And if you yeah. think about how difficult it is to remember the films you saw last year. <laughs> and um, people are still buzzing and talking about this film as if it were just made, as if, as if it were fresh. And it is fresh because the material and the execution holds up. But, um, you know, think about it. A film 30 years later re-released, still going out on a tour, selling out to theaters, um, uh, to a crowd, you know, all over the country, and and literally all the the programmers that I talk to know the film and love the film. Um, wow, it's, a, a, it's an amazing thing. I'm not having to do a, any kind of guarantee or hard sell. It's like, oh, Jackie, oh my God, I can't believe you're on the phone with me, and let's book it and um, let's do it. <laughs> the and 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 
and literally they fly me out. Uh, Alamo Draft House flew me out. Um, so did nice. Kansas City Screening. So did Denver at the Alamo Draft House. Um, they the fans wanted to know about the film because it affected them so. It, whether they saw it before and it affected them profoundly, or or the other half is they bring friends that have never seen the film before, and mm. they love the film. It's like mind blowing for them. So it's, well, and I'm sure it's. Status. I'm sure it's even more amazing when you see it with a whole audience in a theater on the big screen. You know, it's it's going to be a blast. Yeah, it really becomes a whole happening, and. Yeah, and that to me, when you asked how I feel, I said that to me is the satisfaction that the film held up, and not only did it hold up, it still is affecting new audiences in a way, like I said, where where you you can't even remember what you saw last week, yet alone right. a film made uh, when I made this film, and I think that's sort of a testament to the the, the film and 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 you know, uh, hopefully my ability as a director. Um, oh yeah, definitely. I think yeah, I think that uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, that I'm happy about. I can't complain. You know, my daughter is way impressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's like a because after every screening, it's, you know, there's usually usually a line of people that want to meet me or get my autograph. It's almost like Monster Palooza, where and I <laughs> this is never. Uh, it's not something I'm a, I'm used to or accustomed to at all. A lot because I thought there'd be a party and I'd just be partying, and, but literally there's a line of the from the screening of people that want my autograph or want to want to um, buy a Blu-ray or want to talk to me. And so my daughter is with me, and her job is to sell the T-shirts. The she's got the T-shirts for the tour, and mm-hmm. so cute and the pictures. And she goes, Mom, this is like a, a like a Justin Bieber concert. All these people are coming up, and it's for, for her it's like like very funny, um, right? <laughs> They want my mom's <laughs> autograph. Yeah. And she goes, and oh my God, mom, they're all these really cute guys. <laughs> She's going to want to hang out with you all the time now, Jackie. Oh, she, she loves it. She goes, she's, she goes, I, you know, she goes with me everywhere. She'll fly with me up to Vancouver, to Seattle. Oh, that's to great. And she makes a lot of money doing it. It's actually really cute. And I told her, um, so she's a big help, and but she's way blown away by this sort of fan base that her mom, her mom has. Oh, I'm has, sure. Um, That's so exciting. Now, is she, does she want to direct or get into the industry at all? No, she is a, um, a musician. She's, um, she's a ah. songwriter. And a, yeah, she's quite a, quite, if I don't say so myself, quite a very talented songwriter and musician. So um, she's been. Uh, she'll be. She'll be playing here in LA sometime soon. She's already written uh, um, some songs that her uh, her um, teacher wants her to uh, put together a set, and and she'll be performing here in LA. So I'll make. We'll make an announcement. But yeah, uh, you know, I don't wonderful. want her to do it until she's ready. And um, I'm not. I'm not a stage mom. I'm not going to push her. But I have to say that her teacher pushes her because her songwriting ability is very is really good. Uh-huh. Um, so. So I'm happy about that. Um, she's, well, maybe uh, her song will be in your next movie. Well, for sure, I will put her her music in my films. But I think that she's she's able. To, you know, one of the things I think I'm able to do as a film director is move my audience, whether it's to make them laugh or to uh, shock them or to right. scare them. It's something that I, you know, that's what I do. What she does in music is the same thing. You know, she's able to move her move the listener. So, you know, the, the, a bunch of teenage girls are over and they're all like sort of, oh, I don't, forgive me if I laugh at your music kind of attitude. And then, uh-huh. then when they hear it, I, I walk in and everyone's crying. Uh, <laughs> so That yeah, is ability, awesome. Yeah, that ability to move through yeah. really beautiful lyrics and, and melody. And uh, that's hard. I, I think that's the hardest thing possible, really, is to... Move your audience, and and as any artist or any performer um, would uh, would would want is uh, is to be able to move that audience um, emotionally, um, and I think that's why my films hold up as well. As I as I, it certainly delivers on the uh, on the. Uh, you know, there's no way you're going to sit there passively through one of my films. 
No, there's um, no downtime. You're not bored. You don't think, well, is this ever over? I mean, you're constantly entertained in some way. It, it's wonderful, yeah, I don't, really. I don't, it is fun. It, 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 I learned this in a, in a – if you read the autobiography by Kurosawa, something like an autobiography, he, there's a moment in, in a director's life where you realize that you are manipulating feelings, Mm. And that that you have to be very conscious of the of the way you're moving your audience through the story. I'm not saying as a false manipulation, but as a, as some kind of a of a movement. It's not haphazard, um, right? To create that um, sensation, um, Hitchcock is obviously a match, master of that. There's nothing haphazard about one shot, and um, and it's all designed for a for an effect. And uh, and I'm and I and sometimes I I see certain films and I'm very conscious of that and I'll go oh my god I think that director's too obvious with the manipulation do you know what I'm saying it's not done yeah. skillfully yeah um but but I think that you can't see anything I do coming <laughs> no, no you I, can't <laughs> I, I really think that that's that's really Jackie Kong right there you just can't see it coming. And, um, and, 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 but then when you are moved on some level, it's a pleasant surprise. Yes, it is. Uh, before we run out of time, where can people find you, get updates? Uh, are you on Twitter, Facebook, websites, where? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not a, a Twitter person, though I think there, uh, there is some Twitter for finding Sheetar, the, um, the, but mostly on Facebook. Go to um, www.facebook.findingshitar, which is the goddess. Or you could just Google, you know, the blood diner screening and after party um, schedule, and it'll come up on Facebook. We're going to be um, uh, the schedule is on that Facebook um, page. So, or you could just look up Jackie Kong film director on Facebook as well or uh and there's very and there's some information on my um website which is jackiekongfilms.com but the as far as the tour goes if you want to catch the Blood Diner Insanity tour um yeah. go to the Facebook uh page and it's got all the dates and there are more dates coming up on the west coast we've already done the west, the east coast so we're not I'm waiting for the weather to get better and then we'll finish up on the west coast um and then I'm going to Hawaii I'm going to Hawaii. Soon. <laughs> going to take a nice vacation, much needed vacation. Yeah. Well, the tour is a, is work. It's a it's a the, sure. it's actually much work than one realizes. So, you're, well, I'm touring with my daughter, um, talking about the film, and uh, talking about other things that we're working on. So, um, sure. If you want to know what I'm working on, you've got to show up to a blood diner screening. Um, and again, it'll. It'll be in Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and closing in LA with Shriekfest. And I'm happy you're presenting it. I'm honored. I Ooh, understand. I'm Shriekfest honored. Is- Thank you so yeah. so much. I have had a blast getting to know you, Jackie, and I cannot wait to show your movie to fans who already know it and to new people who haven't seen it yet. It's going to be such a delight. Can't wait, and um, and I think we'll we're we're planning it now. So stay tuned, everyone. Thank you and so much, try- Jackie, for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, and we will uh, game plan. Uh, let's talk yes. later on, Denise. Yes. And um, uh, I'll let you go. Uh, uh, is there another guest coming on after me, or is, no? Is, no, uh, the show is over in about forty seconds. Okay, great. Well, um, so thank you again. You. And we will and, talk soon. Um, Take care. Yeah, yes, we will. Thank you so much, Jackie. You have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. 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 Uh, that was wonderful, guys. Make sure you check the Twitter page and her Facebook page because we will be tweeting out updates on when the exact date it will be in L.A. And um, we're going to help her promote the other showings as well across the country. Very, very exciting. So uh, I look forward to seeing you guys there. All right, have a great night, and I'll see you back here next week. You're listening to Live Paranormal Radio at LiveParanormal.com. You are listening to Shriek Fest Radio.
put a new face on an old kitchen. The Home Depot's cabinet experts can reface your kitchen cabinets for a mini makeover in a fraction of the time and cost of new cabinets. Our licensed local experts can get the job done right, right away. So don't face another year in an outdated kitchen. Try refacing it only at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. To learn more, visit homedepot.com slash refacing. License numbers available at homedepot.com slash license numbers, including CGC 1514813 and CRC 0468858. Put a new face on an old kitchen. The Home Depot's cabinet experts can reface your kitchen cabinets for a mini makeover in a fraction of the time and cost of new cabinets. Our licensed local experts can get the job done right, right away. So don't face another year in an outdated kitchen. Try refacing it only at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. To learn more, visit homedepot.com slash refacing. License numbers available at homedepot.com slash license numbers, including CGC 1514813 and CRC 046858.